Good morning, Mr. Chair and Commissioners. I gave you three handouts. Um, one is the Minnesota COVID case information, that first single page. Um, and that just gives the, the latest uh, data that we have, the latest numbers. And you can see uh, we have 47,000, a little over 47,000 positive cases in Minnesota. Um, 922 are new cases, so that's uh, been an increase that we haven't seen for a while. So um, some of that has to do with testing, but some of it is also uh, because of uh, you know the community spread. So it's a combination. About 86% of the um, people have recovered in Minnesota, so that's good. The number of completed tests were at 867,410. So that's a pretty good milestone. Uh, the governor wanted about 20,000 tests a day. So, um, so that's good that they're able to continue on with the number of tests. And then um, you'll see the age category, oh, the hospitalizations too. So in Minnesota, which is for Clay County, it's different because our hospitalizations are occurring, the majority of them in Sanford and Essentia. Um, but these are just uh, hospitalizations across Minnesota. Um, so there's 247 that are hospitalized, that's across the whole state, and 115 that are in ICU. And then you see just the spread. Now it's a little deceiving on the travel um, exposure, um, especially for Clay County, because they're counting travel um, going over to the North Dakota side. So that's counted in the numbers, which we know there's a lot of people going back and forth. So it's not that the travel um, exposure is higher um, because of travel. It's just that they're, they're counting that travel from Minnesota to North Dakota. And then on the second page, uh, the double-sided double page where we have the confirmed cases. So as of July 20th, we were at 669. And again, sometimes these numbers will vary based on when they get the data and, and when it gets inputted. So the numbers can change, but 660 nine as of the 20th, 602 that are uh, recovered or out of isolation. Um, and then we have 28 active cases and we have, um, sad to say, but we have an additional death. <coughs> so we're up to 39 um, and, and you may have heard already, we have a nine month old in Clay County um, death. No, that's the youngest death in Minnesota. There's been some deaths from that zero to five throughout the United States. Uh, but this is the, the youngest one. And okay. it's really a specific situation and a very isolated incident. Um, this, the infant did have respiratory symptoms uh, that were consistent with COVID. There's, so there was inflammation in the lungs. Um, and they also did a nasal swab that tested positive for COVID. Um, the infant did not have any underlying health conditions. So they do have the CDC um, evaluating this case because it is very unique. Um, I have a question on that too. Sure. And you said all the, the hospital ones are in Fargo. Was this infant not in a the hospital then? Or? That's correct. The infant was not in a hospital. Okay. Very mm -hmm. good. And so CDC is really looking at uh, <clears throat> you know, the physiological um, changes in, in terms of the progression of this illness. So it's a very specific um, case. Um, I can't really give much more than that, that it's just uh, we're waiting on CDC to evaluate that and also the medical examiner um, to see if there's, um, there were other, other things with this infant. So it's a sad case, um, unfortunate and uh, I don't know if you have any questions that I can, that I can actually answer. It's, it's, it's a protected case as well, just so, uh, you know, there's, there's not all the information out there just to protect the family. Okay. I have a question. Uh, maybe you don't have the answer. As we go later into the year, into influenza season and RSV season, uh, so many of those uh, affect children more and so is the concern now with it presenting in a under one year old that they will play off each other in terms of severity going forward well we we do know that um, 
as we go into the influenza season, you're right, so if we have influenza circulating as well as COVID, um, it'll be very challenging. Um, we, we hope that people will take advantage of the influenza vaccine um, because if you get both the viruses, it's, it's going to be uh, more impactful. We know that for, for people and, and for children. And the RSV, yeah, I, I wonder if we'll see more people presenting or calling their physicians. So as children develop respiratory symptoms, there would be, because it's all respiratory. So influenza is respiratory, COVID is respiratory. Um, so I think there, there might be a heightened awareness about if there's some respiratory um, symptoms that um, people may be more likely to contact their physician right away to make sure it's not um, COVID and if it's RSV or some other. But it, it is going to be kind of complicated in the fall because I think we're going to see everything circulating at the <coughs> time. So it's going to be quite challenging, I believe, to, to discern you know, the difference if they have influenza or if they have COVID particularly. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I don't know if it's an easy answer. Right, yeah. Some physicians are, are um, expecting that they might see higher numbers of people calling and checking about their children's respiratory um, symptoms. Any other questions? Question. Yeah. Yes, uh, Kathy. Um, one statistic I noticed that is omitted from most of this information is the so-called case fatality rate. And that is uh, de described as the number of deaths divided by the number of positive cases. Worldwide, the percentage is 4.2%. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, in the U.S., the percentage is 3.7%. Mm -hmm. In Minnesota, it's 3.2%. But in Clay County, it's 5.8%. Do you have any idea why we have a nearly twice as high re rate of case fatality rate in Clay County? You know, I have not um, got any information on that data, but I can certainly find out for you. I, I don't know why that percentage is so high. Okay. I would like to find out what's sure. going on with that. I can, I can get and that information. And it may be simply you. that we have such a high percentage of residents that are in long-term care. Yeah, um, we did have a lot of long-term care. Um, fatalities. In, yeah, fatalities <laughs> and incidents at the beginning. In fact, the majority of our deaths were long-term care. So that could be the uh, possibility, but I, I would like to confirm that, so I'll get you that information. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions about the, the data um, or the case? Okay. Well, um, Cheryl, do you want to talk about, we'll just sure. give you an update on, on the school. Schools. Good morning. Um, last week, Commissioner Mojo had a question about the number of international students in Clay County, and so I did follow up with that and reached out to both Concordia and uh, Minnesota State University of Moorhead. So for Concordia, out of about 2,000 students, I'll approximately have 20 international students, and uh, they reported that part of the reasons that those numbers are, are down is because of travel and visa issues. For uh, MSUM, uh, approximately 5,000 uh, registered <coughs> students, um, and they have about 30 international students that will be on campus. And of course, that also includes, um, I don't have the exact number of, of the international students that remained here from last spring semester to that were unable to get home. So not, not a real high number for either one of them. But I appreciate you getting that. I think that's important going forward. And Absolutely. There. And we're having ongoing discussions with both campuses um, as they continue to move forward to plan. Um, we're probably about a month out uh, from students coming back to campus. I know Concordia has offered in the past, uh, their freshmen have always been uh, required to live on campus. And this fall, uh, they are stating that if they aren't able to live off campus if they're in the local area and can still live at home, um, that they certainly are permiss permissible to do so. Um, we're also continuing um, discussions with K through 12. Um, initial guidance came out roughly a month ago and uh, MDH is also <coughs> making some revisions to that. And so um, all of our K-12 districts are, are making plans to uh, to find out whether or not they're going to be 
in class or if it's going to be a hybrid of partially in class and partially uh, online learning or if it would be totally online learning and of course I think for that third scenario our numbers would have to go up significantly for that to happen because everyone really understands the importance of having children in school and especially for those children uh, with special needs that receive extra services at school it's it's highly important uh, to their daily life too. Are you expecting Governor Waltz to make that announcement at the end of this week or is it next? Um, yeah. I was just informed this morning from Kelsey, our PIO, that Governor Walls is doing a briefing today at 2 o'clock. Okay. So yeah, we anticipate that he would speak to that for sure. Great. Thank you. Yeah. And then I'll have Jamie talk about just kind of our, I, we handed out a new form, it's the two-sided one, just about um, so, some of our operations. So, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Good morning. Um, so this basically, our incident management team is reviewing um, kind of what our objectives are for the week and what things we need to uh, work on, most of which, if you look at the objectives, how it's laid out, most of them are ongoing, so it's continuing to be the work. But I wanted to highlight a, a few things. The first objective talks about the information for the public, and the second is about our external partners. So those are really about communicating both. Our public information team is working with um, using a multiple multiple sites, one of which is um, also they're um, po posting on Facebook the board meetings, the um, <coughs> presentations, the press conferences. So continuing to use all avenues to get information out to the public. Um, a lot of that is just a link to CDC or MDH on what is the most current. And then our, the second objective is really what we're doing with our partners. And so we have one abbreviation in there under the second objective is the HON, the Health Alert Network. And so that's where information that we need to share from, sometimes it comes from CDC to the Minnesota Department of Health and local part, public health, and sometimes from the Minnesota Department of Health, but that is to give information to our local healthcare partners in the community, and, and occasionally it's our school partners as well. So that's our health alert network. Um, we've talked a lot about the Red River Valley Task Force and the, the priorities that we're working on it, um, for making sure that we get testing. Um, I do wanna point out uh, one, comment that I was thinking about is that we were fortunate in Clay County to have testing for our most vulnerable populations earlier than much of Minnesota because of our opportunities for testing on the North Dakota side. So that might be why we had a higher um, positivity rate with our long-term care. Just a thought when you were asking the question that I was thinking about. But um, moving on to our third objective, the I e IQES, um, Isolation and Quarantine Essential Services. We talked a little bit about the people that are in isolation and quarantine and we reach out to them if there are things that they need, often just connecting them with the local grocery store that is able to deliver or um, getting resources through the food shelf. So that's part of what we talked about there. Um, we've talked a lot about long-term care, so I'll skip over that objective. And um, one thing I just want to highlight is we still do have our long-term care liaisons working <coughs> weekly now with our um, long-term care providers, including our corporate foster care, just checking in with them primarily to see what they're doing in terms of um, testing, if they still need testing, and then also the resources they have. Um, and Cheryl is working with them to get the resources that they would need for PPE and things. Um, let's see, so then I'm going to skip over to the back page to highlight a couple things. And one thing that Josh has been working on um, has been closed pods. So I'm gonna skip down, I, these objectives are not um, numbered, but the second from the bottom. So it's education closed bot, pods, MOU. And so that is, POD is a um, point of dispensing and MOU, Memorandum of Understanding. So that's something Josh is working on, thinking in advance about the fact that if we have a vaccine um, that comes and how can we distribute that vaccine. So those points of dispensing would be working with our partners that are already able to give injections. So that vaccine would come to public health and would be distributed out to the points of dispensing like healthcare providers, long-term care providers who are able to administer vaccines. So he's working on, that's an ongoing thing for emergency preparedness with Josh, but he is also working on updating those 
um, points of dispensing and memorandums of understanding. So that's something that he's been busy working on too. Um, any questions about the objectives? Um, Josh is our planning section chief, right. so he is, um, so he, throughout this pandemic, he um, does all the planning, but he also has to um, document everything for the reports, um, so he's not only doing the work um, ongoing, but also, like Jamie mentioned, planning for the future for like our points of dispensing when the vaccine arrives, so this is all um, Josh's work as he continues to do the planning piece. So, Kathy or uh, Jamie? In, the, in these objectives, have we, um, <coughs> to the implementation of any of these, are we considering costs? I, I think Kathy goes to our CARES Act committee group. There's where I'm getting at here is we want to make sure that your department is well funded to handle all of these things moving forward. <coughs> um, and it goes back to your again to the colleges what are their intentions for future testing and, and I'm assuming that testing is going to fall back on public health to do or are they do they have their own program in place um, so currently um, Minnesota Department of Health is not in favor of doing initial baseline testing for students coming back to campus because they just they don't have the resources when you think about the number of students in the state of Minnesota Resources meaning just the available tests or? Uh, maybe available tests, but just the logistics of it. Okay. Too, because it takes a lot of manpower to be able to bring people to Moorhead, um, say if they're going to either any of our campuses here in Clay County, uh, to be able to provide to do that. And so that is not their recommendation at this time. Um, but we did have a Minnesota Department of Health representative come to speak with both Concordia and MSUM last Monday, which we mentioned a little bit at last week's board meeting, um, and just talking about that a number of students from both of those campuses or any of our campuses uh, in Clay County also live on the North Dakota side. And so uh, through the Red River Valley Task Force, if the opportunity arises, and as I explained to both of these universities, we don't know what that's going to look like. We don't know if North Dakota is going to be able to provide um, any support to actually bring that testing to campus, um, or if it would be staged somewhere on the North Dakota side and people would have to go over across uh, to get tested. Um, but that would just be for a baseline testing. So uh, I believe that both Concordia and MSUM are, are taking all of that into consideration. It's certainly not going to be mandatory, um, but if there are individuals that wish to be tested, um, we'll certainly do everything that we can uh, to assist them with that. And I know um, Minnesota Department of Health um, also recognizes that they just don't have the um, all of the means to, for ongoing testing. So they are recommending that we use some CARES money if we can come up with um, facilities to um, provide testing. That's where I'm going with this. Mm -hmm. So if we, if we can, um, and there are some counties that have allocated some of the CARES money to ongoing testing. And so if we can find a vendor, they're also having challenges finding vendors that um, can do the testing. So if we can find vendors in our community and then we have the CARES money to be able to pay for that, um, that's what they're asking us to look at. Yeah, I, I, I just, I think it would be in our best interest to reach out and, and to have a, a standby facility that would, might be willing to, um, you know, the, that's, that those funds, uh, that's, I can't think of a better way to use those funds, was, you know, to, other than to help businesses that have suffered severely from this, but. Great. Um, so I, I would encourage you to, you know, <coughs> between the three of you and your department to come back to our CARES committee group with, with a, a number that you think would be good for us to reserve. Um, and including in that would be additional tracing costs 
as we look forward to what Commissioner referred to is when we start getting into um, this season where we could have multiple respiratory deals going on here so yeah and we um, have a Red River Valley task force meeting tomorrow so we plan to have a discussion about the testing and then determine you know how we're going to work collaboratively on that so thank you any further questions for him no thank you for the report update again this week thank you, thank you.